Good afternoon, welcome back to Cambridge University Astronomy, where we are doing yet another one of our interactive uh, astronomy talks. Um, today we are going to be answering a question which I was very confused about uh, when I was in school, and I think I've been asked this question hundreds of times over the last few years. Um, it's a very quick question. Is there gravity in space? Um, so I think I'm going to kick off. Before I do anything else, I'm going to put this question to the audience. So before we start talking about this, I want to get your opinions. Uh, what do you think about gravity in space? Um, the way you're going to be answering this is by using Slido. So all of our talks here at Cambridge University Astronomy are interactive and we use Slido. Uh, so you can ask me questions and I can ask you questions. Uh, so the way to join is to go to slido.com and use hashtag orbit or to make life even easier if you scan that handy little QR code type thing on the right hand side with a mobile phone that will let you join uh, to jo join the chat. Um, so I'm going to be asking you a couple of questions as we go along, and then at the end of the talk there'll be a Q&A session, so you'll have the chance to ask me a bunch of questions as well. So any questions about gravity or space that you like. So um, let's have a look. We're going to start off about asking, is there gravity in space? Before we do that, it's probably worth defining what space actually is. Uh, so those of you that were here last week when we were talking about the new space race will remember that space starts at what we call the Kármán line and that is above mountains. So Mount Everest is about eight kilometers above the surface of the Earth. Planes fly even higher, about 10 kilometers above Earth, which is really only just a bit above Everest. It's why planes don't fly over high mountains. Meteors, so shooting stars, happen around 70 kilometers above the surface of the Earth. So you can think of this as almost the edge of space, if this is where meteors are starting to hit our atmosphere. And then far above meteors, we have the International Space Station, which is very much in space. The dividing line between space and not space is going to be somewhere above shooting stars and below the space station. And we define space as being 100 kilometers above the ground. So if you're above 100 kilometers, you are in space. And that's been called over the Kármán line. And a lot of people think of there being no gravity in space, of course, because astronauts on the space station float around. So we're going to start off our poll, uh, start off with this question. Is there gravity in space? So let me know what you think. Uh, the answer, your options are yes, no, and not sure if you want to uh, save your answer until we have spoken a bit more about how gravity in space works. Um, I can also see some fantastic questions coming through. So yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you to the people that have answered so far. Um, I Yes, I will be saving your questions until the very end. So you can ask me questions on anything I'm talking about or anything even about astronomy that you want to know the answer to. And we'll get to all of those at the end. I can see um, Arthur and Jake uh, have already sent in some fantastic questions. So we'll get to all of those at the end. Um, until then, is there gravity in space? I'm going to have a look at uh, what people are saying. So 70, about two, about three quarters of you say the answer is yes, that there is some gravity in space. Uh, about 20% of you, 17% of you saying uh, that there is no gravity in space. Interesting. Okay, let's go forward and see, uh, let's see how things look. So of course, once you are in space, uh, you, uh, so for example, you can be on somewhere like the International Space Station. And these are some videos from the International Space Station. So they show astronauts floating around. This is one astronaut, um, and you can see she is floating around on the International Space Station, so much so that her hair is all kind of wacky and poking up in the air because it's not, uh, it's not hanging down around her shoulders on the way that it does on Earth. This is another great video I really like of an astronaut on the space station. This is Chris Hadfield, a Canadian astronaut, and people have sent him a package of some nice snacks and you can see it all just floats in front of him. This came up on the Dragon spaceship recently, but I have a lot of nice uh, food. I have uh, Canadian maple cookies. Uh, I have a smoked salmon pate, some Canadian chocolate. Uh, look at this, a tube, a tube of maple syrup. 
So I, I love this video. It's so cool that you can just pull the things out the bag and then they just float there in front of him. And if you look as well, the microphone that he's talking into is also floating there in front of his face. So things very much float around in the International Space Station. In other words, things on the space station look weightless, right? The question is why? Why do things on the space station seem weightless? And I think this is where people get the idea that there's no gravity in space because things look like they float around in space. So I'm going to give you, first of all, the wrong answer. Here's how people think going to space works. I think if you're going to walk up to some people on the street and ask them about, you know, whether there's gravity in space and how people going, how going to space works, they would give you an answer that looked something like this. And the hint is, of course, this is the wrong answer. I'm going to tell you what people think, and then I'm going to tell you the right answer a bit later on. So I think if you were to ask people on the street, they would say that we live on Earth, and Earth has an atmosphere around it. And then, of course, once you're outside of the atmosphere, <clears throat> you are in space. And so what you do, you build a rocket and you fly very far away from the Earth and you get far enough outside the atmosphere that you count as being in space. And of course, the Earth has gravity, which we're all feeling right now. But if you get far away, then you don't feel gravity anymore and you can float around in the space station. Um, I think that's what a lot of people would tell you. This is completely wrong. This is the wrong answer, right? So astronauts don't float around in the space station because they are far away from Earth. Um, so this is a, this is the, the wrong picture to have. So when you think about astronauts going to space, don't think about this. Uh, I'll give you the right answer in a moment. Um, the answer to the question that I asked you before, is there gravity in space, is a big yes. There is absolutely gravity in space. There is gravity everywhere in space. Gravity as a force goes on forever and ever and ever. So even things that are very far apart can pull on each other with gravity. So the space station is about 400 kilometers above the Earth, but the moon is much further away. The moon is about 300,000 kilometers away from the Earth. And the moon goes around the Earth because of the Earth's gravity, right? The Earth's gravity makes the moon uh, go in orbit around the Earth. So gravity, the Earth's gravity extends all the way to the moon. So it has to cover the space station. And we can get even further out. If we think about our solar system, all of the planets in our solar system are circling around the sun. And that's because the gravity of the sun holds the solar system together. So there is gravity everywhere in space. If you ever hear say, someone saying there's no gravity in space, uh, it's totally not true. So how does this work then? Why do astronauts float around if there is gravity? Um, just, so, just to just make, show you how weird the problem is, the space station is 400 kilometers above the surface of the Earth. And that's where these astronauts are floating around weightless. The gravity 400 kilometers above the Earth is about 90% as strong as the gravity on the Earth's surface. So think about how much gravity you're feeling right now as you sit in your chair. The gravity uh, 400 kilometers up where the astronauts are is 90% as strong, which means if you could build a very, very tall tower 400 kilometers high and then stand on the top, um, you would need a ladder to get up there and you, you, you would need a, a space helmet to give you air to breathe. But if you could stand on the top of a tower 400 kilometers high, you would feel pretty normal gravity. You'd be able to jump up and down and the gravity would pull you down. And if you drop your phone, your phone would fall off and fall the 400 kilometers back down to the surface of the Earth. And you would feel all this normal gravity while the astronauts and the space station at exactly the same height above the Earth as you are floating around weightless. You could look in the window as, the, as it uh, drifted past you and see them floating around. So how does this work then? Why does it seem like there's no gravity in space, right? So once we know that the answer is yes, there's gravity in space, we have another question. Why does it seem like there's no gravity in space? How do astronauts float around? So I'm going to give you an answer in two parts. And we're going to combine, I'm going to give you two different pieces of the jigsaw puzzle. And then we're going to put them together and have the entire answer. And we don't have to talk about space for either piece. So we're going to do what in science we call thought experiments, which means to think about how something would work. And that teaches you something about the world. So the first th uh, thought experiment, the first piece of the jigsaw puzzle, we're going to think about doing a parachute jump. So we're going to think about doing a skydive and jumping 
out of the plane. So imagine that you are a person jumping out of a plane and doing a parachute jump down to earth and you're going to bring something heavy with you. You're going to bring like a bowling ball for example. It's a heavy thing and you're going to jump out of the plane holding the bowling ball and then as you fall you're going to let go and you're going to fall to earth uh, next to the bowling ball. I want you to imagine what that would be like. What's it going to look like for you if you jump out of the plane holding a bowling ball and then you let go? Well, the bowling ball is going to be falling at the same time as you, right? So it's going to stay right in front of you. Um, I'm going to make this easier. You don't have to imagine it because I have a video of uh, a bowling ball and skydiving. So here are three people who are doing a sky skydive and they've brought a bowling ball with them, which is the orange thing, which you can see there on the left. And they're going to jump out of the plane and they're going to let go of the bowling ball. So there it goes. They've tied some ribbons to it uh, just to make it easier to see. And so the bowling ball is falling to earth and the skydivers are falling to earth as well. So they've all jumped down the plane together and they're all falling towards the earth. And because they're falling at the same speed, the ball is in front of them and they can even kind of like, you know, pass it around and bat it together because they're all falling together. Now, what does this remind you of? Um, this reminds me a lot of how it looks for astronauts in the space station because even though these skydivers are falling and the ball is falling because they're all falling at the same speed it sort of looks like they're weightless right they can drop the bowling ball and it just hangs there in the air in front of them because they're all falling together it's not floating it's falling but it looks like they're weightless those skydivers dropping the bowling ball looked a lot like that astronaut dropping food in front of him it just kind of stayed there so this is the first piece of the puzzle. When you fall, you feel weightless. So a skydiver dropping a bowling ball as they fall, they're going to see the bowling ball just hanging in the air in front of them because they're all falling at the same speed. And that's why they can kind of like, you know, bat that bowling ball around in front of them. So the first piece of the puzzle is that when you fall towards the earth, you feel weightless and, until you've hit the ground, of course, which is why they have parachutes. The second piece of the puzzle, so that, okay, so that's, that's the first piece of the puzzle. When you fall, you feel weightless. The second piece of the puzzle we can get by thinking about a cannon. So imagine you've got a cannon and you're going to shoot cannonballs out. And first of all, you're going to do a pretty, pretty puny shot and just put not very much gunpowder in and the ball is going to get shot out the cannon. And as soon as it leaves the cannon, it starts falling towards the earth. But because it's going sideways, it also goes sideways. And so it curves down and lands. And you could shoot a cannonball a bit harder and it would go further and further and further. And it's still falling the whole time, but it just because it's going faster, it goes sideways more and more before it curves down and crashes into the ground. And you hope you get out of the way because being hit by a cannonball wouldn't be fun. Now, do you think you could shoot a cannonball around the world? Like if you shot a cannonball fast enough, do you think you, you could shoot a cannonball around the world? Well, the answer is yes. You would just have to shoot the cannonball really, really fast. Um, and in fact, there's a magic speed that would let you shoot the cannonball all the way around the world. If you try shooting at 5,000 kilometers an hour, it wouldn't quite make it. It would come out the cannon and then it would fall back to earth. Uh, put more gunpowder in, get it to 10,000 kilometers an hour. It would go further and it would curve around a lot more, but it would still land. Even 20,000 kilometers an hour wouldn't do it. It would come out the cannon and then it would fall all the way around in this long curve back to earth. And you can see what's happening. The path of the cannonball is curving round because it's going sideways and the earth, because the earth is round, it curves around the earth and then lands on the other side of the world. But if you could shoot a cannonball at this magic speed of 28,000 kilometers an hour, it would go so fast, it would go all the way around the world and get back to where you started. And this one is no different to all the others. Every single cannonball is falling, right? So they are falling as soon as they get shot. And they either fall a little bit or a bit more. But if you shoot one at this magic speed of 28,000 kilometers an hour, it still falls. It just falls all the way around the world in a curve and gets back to where it started. It looks like this. But of course, even getting back to where it started, it's still going to be going really, really fast, right? So there's nothing stopping it, just carrying on for another lap. And so if you shoot a cannonball around the world with this speed of 28,000 kilometers an hour, it would just go in circles around the world forever because it would do one lap and then there's nothing to stop it just doing another lap. And it's falling the whole time. Um, it's just falling and going sideways very, very fast. And so it falls in a circle around the world. 
So this is a, this is the thing to know. The ball is always falling. It's being pulled back to Earth by Earth's gravity. But because it's going sideways so ridiculously fast, 28,000 kilometers an hour, it always misses the Earth and just curves round in a circle. And this is called being in orbit. So if you shoot a cannonball at 28,000 kilometers an hour, it's so fast to travel in a circle around the world, and that is being in orbit. So this is the second piece of the puzzle. This is the second fact you need to know that lets you understand why astronauts float. If you can go sideways really, really fast, you can fall in a circle around the world. And that's called being in orbit. Now, we've got the two pieces of the puzzle. If you go sideways really fast, you can fall in a circle around the world and you're always falling, uh, but the Earth curves away as you curve away at the same speed. So you go round and round and round. But fact one is that falling makes you feel weightless. So combine these two things, falling makes you, falling makes you feel weightless. And if you go sideways fast enough, you can fall in a circle around the world. You, you work out that orbiting makes you feel weightless. And it's not because there's no gravity. It's because you're always falling. So astronauts feel weightless for exactly the same reason that those skydivers felt weightless as they were kind of like throwing that bowling ball around as they fell out of the plane. It's exactly the same. The only difference is that those skydivers divers are going straight down and so they're going to have to use their parachutes and land safely but because astronauts are going sideways as well they can just miss the earth and go round and round and round forever so knowing this lets you also ask another important question which always confused me when i was younger i remember being in primary school and being very confused about this why do we need really big rockets to go to space? Because space is only 400 kilometers away, right? It's not very far away. But when you see things being launched into space, this is the Mars Perseverance rover that launched last year. It has this huge rocket and this huge, powerful engine to get it into space. But it's actually it's quite easy to launch things into space or it's quite easy to get things very, very high at least. This is a YouTuber called Tom Scott who used a balloon, which you can see there, to get some garlic bread right to the edge of space. Bread to the edge of space! So you can see the garlic bread going up and it's going up in that tiny little balloon. And then a bit later in the video, the garlic bread is up here. So it's not quite in space, because if you remember, the Kármán line is 100 kilometers up, and this is about 36 kilometers up. So it's nearly in space, but not quite. Uh, but it's high enough that it's above a lot of the atmosphere that you can see. So if you can get something almost to space using a balloon, why do you need all these really, really big, expensive rockets? And if you understand orbiting, that tells you the answer. So the garlic bread can go to the edge of space, but it's going to come straight down again. It can't go to it can't go to space and stay there because you need to go really, really, really fast to get into orbit. So going sideways really fast is actually the important bit for getting in, into space or at least getting into space and staying there, which is what you want to do if your job is being an astronaut. It's less about going up and it's more about going sideways really, really fast so you can fall around the Earth in this orbit. So uh, this is this is the way uh, rockets actually get to space. So you have the Earth and an atmosphere and you build a rocket and you launch into space, but you also turn sideways at the same time and fire your engines and travel really, really fast sideways until you hit this magic speed, 28,000 kilometers an hour, which is so fast I can hardly even imagine it. It's about eight kilometers per second, which uh, just kind of makes my brain hurt a bit if I try and imagine how fast it is. But if you can do that, then you orbit around the Earth and stay in space as long as you want. So this picture I told you at the start was was wrong, right? This idea that going into space was all about getting far enough away from the Earth's gravity. Astronauts in the space station are actually very close to the Earth, but they're going sideways so fast, they orbit around and feel weightless. And that's what they need these really big rockets for. It's not because space is hard, far away, and not even really because space is hard to get to. It's because if you want to get into orbit, which means to go to space and stay there, you need to go really, really, really fast, which needs a really, really big engine. Um, there's one more thing which I think uh, this question doesn't answer, which is how do you then get to the moon? When people think about astronauts, one of the first things they think about is getting to the moon. But if you have to go really fast to get into orbit, how do you then go to the moon? 
Well, the answer is you go to orbit first, and then once you're happily orbiting around the Earth, you can then fire your engines again and get to the moon. So this is how it works. So first of all, if you want to go to the moon, you launch off from planet Earth, and you fire your engines and go really, really fast, and you speed up to this uh, ridiculously fast 28,000 kilometers per hour speed, and then you can be orbiting around Earth. So this is a bit, a bit of a cartoon, right? You've got the Earth on the left and the Moon on the right, and then that, uh, that yellow thing going around is your spaceship orbiting the Earth. And so once you've got into orbit, you've used your big powerful rocket engines to get into orbit, then you wait till you're lined up with the Moon, and then you fire your rocket engines again, and then you can leave the Earth's orbit and travel all the way to the moon. And then if you do your maths right and you use your rocket properly, once you get to the moon, you can land in another moon orbit. And you can go from orbiting around the Earth to orbiting around the moon like this. So even going to the moon starts with going into orbit. You have to kind of get up to this really, really high speed and uh, go around the Earth. And then you feel weightless doing that. And then you go to the moon. Um, orbits are really, really important. Uh, the astronauts orbit around the Earth, and the Moon orbits, uh, and, and the Moon orbits around the Earth as well. And all the planets in the solar system are orbiting around the Sun. Like I'm sure you've heard that word before, but now we know what it means to orbit something is to fall towards it, but also go sideways so fast you just kind of fall in a circle forever and go round and round. So all of the planets are orbiting around the sun for exactly the same reason. And we can even zoom out. Almost everything or lots and lots of things in the universe are orbiting around each other. So galaxies, for example, are spinning because the stars inside galaxies are orbiting around the center. So once you understand this idea that there is gravity everywhere in space and uh, it's orbits that make you feel weightless, um, a lot of, th of things in astronomy start making a lot more sense. Um, okay, so these are the two things I want you to remember from this uh, from today's talk. There is absolutely gravity in space. So if you ever hear someone say there's no gravity in space, uh, you can tell them they are wrong. There is absolutely gravity in space. But astronauts float, and the reason people float around on the space station is because they are falling and moving sideways at the same time, and that's called being in orbit. And that makes you feel weightless, even though uh, there is still lots of gravity around. Um, I hope this has uh, answered your question and hope this uh, has helped you understand orbits. If you've enjoyed this, please uh, consider giving us a subscribe. I am, I am also on Twitter as astronomy underscore Matt. Um, if you want to follow me, I announce uh, all of these talks and stuff that we are doing. Now, I can see so many of your excellent questions coming in on the question and answer. So I'm going to switch over to that now. And, uh, and answer some questions. So um, if you uh, missed the very start, uh, then you can join, uh, join the chat by scanning that QR code in the left-hand side, or you can go to slider.com and use the code ORBIT, and that will let you join in and ask some questions. Okay, so I'm gonna take the first question from Jake, which is, what do astronauts do in space? Well, they do uh, lots of different things. So, of course, astronauts that have the job of going to the moon, they go to the moon, and then once they're on the moon's surface, they can do experiments there. Um, they can uh, do like tests of gravity and uh, set up equipment, maybe, that scientists want to put on the moon. And people on the International Space Station are also doing similar things. Uh, so astronauts on the International Space Station do a lot of science experiments. Um, you can imagine if you if you think about doing science experiments in school, um, you can imagine it might be quite interesting to see what experiments you can do when you don't feel gravity, when you feel weightless. So astronauts in the International Space Station um, do quite a lot of science experiments. Uh, next question. Next question is how do galaxies use the concept of gravity? And what center does this gravity come from? Well, things don't come from a center. So basically everything in the universe that weighs something has gravity, right? So the Earth has gravity and the sun has gravity. But even small things have gravity, like your house has gravity and you have gravity. You don't have very much gravity because the, the amount of gravity uh, that you have is all about how heavy you are. And you are much less heavy than the Earth, right? But everything has gravity. Galaxies have gravity because the stars inside them ha like weigh something, and so all of the stars inside a galaxy have their individual gravity. And then you kind of you add up the gravity of all those stars, and they uh, they combine 
to make the gravity of a galaxy. So it doesn't come from any centre. The gravity of a galaxy comes from adding up all the gravity of the millions and millions of stars that make up the gravity, uh, that make up the galaxy, sorry. How did Newton discover his equation of gravity? That's a really, really good question. Um, Newton, so for anyone that doesn't know, Isaac Newton was a very famous scientist a few hundred years ago, and he's the first person to really work out how gravity works. And he worked out this famous kind of maths equation that described how strong gravity is. Um, I think he, he really just did it by, by thinking very, very hard. Newton was very, very clever. He understood how kind of objects move through space, and he, understand, he understood um, like how things travel through space like light and so he really just thought very hard about gravity the way gravity might work and tried some equations and then evasion eventually came up with his famous equation of gravity um that describes uh that, that describe how things move around uh the, the answer might be being very clever and thinking very hard um another question do gas giants have gravity and if so how much? And that's very similar to Arthur's question below, which is, is there more gravity on Jupiter than Earth? Because, of course, Jupiter is a gas giant planet. Um, the answer to you both um, is yes. Um, gas giants do absolutely have gravity, and there is more gravity on Jupiter than Earth. The um, things... Uh, the gravity of things, the gravitational pull of things uh, it is dictated by how heavy they are. And Jupiter is hundreds of times heavier than the Earth. And so its gravitational pull is hundreds of times stronger. Um, it's so strong that I was going to say if you could stand on Jupiter, because Jupiter is a gas giant, you can't stand on it. But imagine if you could build a floating platform on the surface of Jupiter. You probably couldn't stand up. The gravity would be so strong, um, you, your muscles probably wouldn't be able to support you. So gravity, uh, Jupiter absolutely has more gravity than Earth. And gas giants definitely have gravity. And in general, because gas giants are bigger than the little rocky planet that we live on, gas giants tend to have stronger gravity than Earth. Um, Yanis wants to know, how come Venus is hotter than Mercury when Mercury is closer to the sun? That is also a really, really good question. Um, the answer is because of Venus's atmosphere. So Mercury, it uh, doesn't really have much of an atmosphere. It is a, a ball of rock, really. Venus, though, has a very, very thick atmosphere. And thick, uh, thick atmospheres are very, very good at trapping heat in um, so Venus is very thick atmosphere, basically acts like a kind of a big winter duvet or something all around it. So even though Venus gets hit by less sunlight than Mercury, its thick atmosphere keeps the heat in and keeps Venus nice and toasty warm. Um, so getting some very good questions in, uh, why is the force of gravity weaker than the weak force? Um, uh, I think that's, that's a very, very complicated question uh, for the audience that I was imagining this talk is for. But just to give people a flavor of the problem, problem, we think of gravity as being really, really strong, right? Like if you fall over, you, you hit the ground and it can hurt because gravity just fall, like pulls you down. And if you fall off a ladder or fall off a house, it can be very dangerous uh, because the Earth's whole gravity pulls you down. So we think of gravity as being this really strong force. But actually, gravity is really, really weak. If you imagine uh, putting a piece of metal on the floor, um, the Earth's gravity pulls it down, right, and stops it floating off. But if you got a magnet, you could lift up the piece of metal with a magnet quite easily. If you think about what's happening when you do that, the tiny little magnet you're holding in your hand is using magnetism to beat the gravity of the whole Earth. So a magnet you hold in your hand has like a stronger magnetic force than an entire planet pulling downwards and so this this means that gravity is really really weak like much weaker than the other forces in the universe and at the moment scientists don't really know why gravity is such a puny force um yeah we don't know why that uh, gravity is so weak you can beat it with just one magnet it's one of the mysteries of science that we are still trying to understand do we hear any sound in space? Uh, really excellent question. The answer is no. The way we hear sound here on Earth is via our atmosphere. So the air around us that we breathe is our atmosphere. And when we talk or when we hear sound on Earth, 
what is happening is that there are waves going through the air. So if you, uh, you're hearing me now because I'm talking and the waves of sound come out of my mouth and go into my laptop speakers and then they come out of your laptop speakers and then the waves of sound again will go through the air and hit your ears if there's no air there's no there's no place for the waves of sound to travel and so uh, so sound can't get through so there is absolutely no sound in space films sometimes get films sometimes get this wrong to make it more exciting so if you ever see a film and you where something explodes in space like a spaceship and then it makes a big kaboom sound to everyone watching uh, you know that's not true because there's no air which means there's no sound in space um, but sometimes that can be a bit boring for films, so I understand why they why they fake it and put the kaboom sounds in. How far do you have to go to get into the orbit of Neptune? So Neptune is very far away uh, from Earth. Um, so from the Sun, sorry. So Neptune is uh, me- over a billion miles away from the Sun. So to get into orbit around Neptune would uh, would you'd have to go a very very long way. And in fact, nothing that humans have have ever made has orbited around Neptune. Uh, we've made lots of space programs and we've flown past Neptune and taken photos of it, but we've never we've never got into Neptune orbit. Um, it's very very far away and very difficult to do. Uh, oh yeah, over a billion miles. Um, this is a question that I actually don't know the answer to. How much fuel did they need to launch Apollo 11 into space? Um, I don't know an exact answer, I'm afraid. Uh, the answer is an awful lot. When you see a rocket blasting off, only the very, very tiny tip top of that rocket contains the actual, like, you know, the thing they want to launch into space, like astronauts, for example. Almost all of that entire rocket is pure fuel. So they def- they needed thousands and thousands and thousands of tons of rocket fuel, and I actually don't know how much off the top of my head uh maybe you go and look go and look at tom online and uh, let me know the answer uh felix age six says what is microgravity that is a really really good question as well because if you uh, read about astronauts on the international Sta- space station you will come across this term microgravity and what so microgravity um, is the condition where people seem weightless, right? So what? So because there is gravity in space, but astronauts float, they need a word for it because you can't say it's zero gravity. Because I've spent a lot of uh, a lot of this talk saying, you know, that there is gravity in space, so astronauts aren't in zero gravity. So instead, we say they are in microgravity, which is where they are weightless and not feeling the effect of gravity. So microgravity is when you are orbiting and so you don't feel the effect of gravity it's different from there being no gravity uh, but it means it's how you float when you are weightless Noah wants to know have we ever sent anything into another galaxy the answer is absolutely no for the really simple reason that uh, that space is really 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 big um the nearest big galaxy to us is the Andromeda galaxy, and that's about two and a half million light years away. So even if you could travel at the speed of light, it would still take two and a half million years to reach the nearest big galaxy. And we definitely can't travel anywhere near the speed of light. The fastest thing humans have ever made is a spaceship called Voyager, which went out about 50 years ago to take photos of some of the planets in our solar system. And that uh, Voyager, it took <clears throat> it took photos of all the planets as it went past and then flew out and left our solar system and went out into the Milky Way galaxy. That's traveling at about 60,000 miles an hour. It's easily, it's one of the far, it's easily the fastest thing people have, uh, people have ever made. Even Voyager would take hundreds of thousands of years to get to the nearest star and would take um, like thousands and thousands of millions of years to reach another galaxy. So unfortunately, space is just far too big to send things into other galaxies. Um, we've got two questions uh, about Saturn. Uh, very nice uh, from uh, Yanis and Antine. Um, so Saturn's rings, I'll first of all tell you that how Saturn's formed. Uh, so Saturn's rings formed when one of Saturn's moons got destroyed by Saturn's gravity. 
So Saturn is not like Earth. Earth only has one moon. Saturn has loads of moons. It has uh, nearly 100 moons. Uh, one of Saturn's moons, about 60 million years ago, was in the wrong place at the wrong time and got smashed to bits by Saturn's enormous gravity. And the ring that we see is the leftover debris, the rubble from that moon that got destroyed. It happened around the same time that the dinosaurs died out. So I always think if there were any dinosaur astronomers, then they would have seen Saturn looking like a pretty boring yellow planet. It didn't have any rings around it when the dinosaurs were alive. Um, and, but one day Saturn will lose its rings. So Saturn's rings, because they are this, this ring of debris from a moon that got destroyed, Saturn's rings are raining down onto Saturn very slowly. So Saturn's rings get smaller every year and they will be completely gone in about 100 million years time. So everyone alive today will definitely see Saturn with, with its rings forever. But one day in the far future, Saturn won't have rings anymore. So we've only got 100 million, million years left. So maybe Make the most of them while you can. Um, Jacob asked, uh, what is inside a black hole? Um, th uh, that is a question which I think has a very, very long answer. Um, I think the best way to answer that question will be to tell you to, to uh, look at another video on our channel. So if you subscribe to the channel or just look on the channel below, you'll see that there are lots of different talks for young audiences. And I did a talk last year all about black holes. And I, I, I answer what is inside a black hole uh, quite a lot in that video. To give you a very, very quick answer, uh, the answer is probably nothing. Black holes are very, very 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 tiny indeed and they're not really holes that you can put stuff in they're more just like a black speck in space that weighs as much as a star and would squash you to bits so black holes don't really have an inside uh, there's no such thing as inside a black hole because they're just too tiny um, there's another question here um, about about what gravity actually is, about uh, whether gravity is caused by curving space. And this is actually answered again by another video I have on this channel. Um, uh, so if you look up the gravitational waves talk, um, I can talk about this. I talk about this quite a lot. Um, to give you a really quick answer, if it's not too confusing, um, oh, there's a wonderful answer to the Apollo question. Thank you very much for looking that up. Um, now I, I've learned something today. I'm very happy about that. Thank you. Um, so yeah, you t uh, the the Einstein question. Deep down, uh, gravity is all to do with space being a bit curvy. So it sounds very weird, but space and time are flexible, like being like a trampoline or something. And big things like the Earth or the Sun actually bend space and time, and that's what that's what causes gravity on like a kind of a deep down level. Um, this is quite complicated and definitely uh, more complicated than the things I'm talking about today. Uh, but yes, to answer the question, yes, what gravity actually is is space being a bit bendy. And if you want to have a look more about that, then yes, there is the gravitational wave talk on this channel, uh, which I can which I talk about a lot more. Um, how fast does a black hole? I think the word is shrink. Says Noah. Black holes do shrink. Uh, a very famous scientist called Stephen Hawking worked out that black holes uh, shrink away over time. Um, they take a very, very long time to do it. Um, even a small black hole, like a, a black hole the size of a star or something, would take uh, many, many, many billions and billions and billions and billions of years uh, to disappear. And very big black holes are going to take even longer. They're going to take so long to shrink that the total age of our universe is nothing compared to it. So black holes shrink very, very slowly. Uh, uh, Haley asks, what's the farthest away planet from the sun? That's very easy to answer. It's Neptune. Um, it used to be Pluto. Uh, but then uh, as in 2006, we uh, the astronomers decide... Oh, I've got a hiccup, excuse me. Astronomers decided that Neptune, uh, sorry, that Pluto doesn't count as a planet anymore, which makes Neptune the furthest planet from the sun. Um, what would have happened if Earth had rings like Saturn? That's a really cool question. I, I'm not sure if much would have happened. I think they would look really, really amazing. It would definitely affect launching things into space. I think it would be much, much harder to launch satellites and launch astronauts into space because even though the rings of Saturn are kind of very, very spread out and dusty, it would be very hard to uh, to orbit inside them because you know, you'd, you'd be going very, very fast. So you'd be smacking yourself against rocks all the time, which is quite a bad thing when you're in space. So if uh, if 
uh, yeah, if, if Earth had a ring, I think space travel would be a lot more difficult. But also, it would look a lot more pretty from Earth. I think it would be amazing. Imagine standing on the surface of Earth and seeing this big kind of like shiny ring uh, around the sky. Um, I think it would be really, really incredible. Like imagine some like painters would do amazing paintings um, of Earth if we had a ring around us. Um, Timothy, has a spaceship ever been sucked inside a black hole? Very happy to say that the answer is no. Even the nearest black hole to us is thousands of light years away, which is much, much, much further than anyone or anything made by humans has ever travelled. Um, so nothing has ever been sucked inside a black hole and we are totally safe from black holes, I'm very glad to say. Um, Haley says, did you know there are 50 billion galaxies? There are actually quite a lot more galaxies than that. So... In the observable universe, like the part of the universe that we can see, a good guess uh, for the number of galaxies is about 2,000 billion. Um, so there are, and that's only in the universe we can see, there might be more universe beyond that with even more galaxies. Uh, there are many, many, many galaxies in the universe. Um, if you let a balloon into space, how would you get it back? Um, so first of all, if you let a balloon into space, so if so, I, maybe you're talking about the, the video I showed you before, what would happen, it goes up and up and up, and then as it goes up and up and up, the atmosphere gets thinner and thinner and thinner. And after a while, it gets so high that the pressure inside the balloon is too much from the atmosphere, and, and it would pop. Uh, and the balloon would pop and then the and then whatever it was carrying would fall back down to earth and i think what you would have to do you'd have to put like a gps or a little location tracker on it so you could find where it landed and you'd have to go and walk like walk or drive to it and then pick it up so i think the way you get it back is that you'd have to wait for it to pop in space and then when it falls back down you'd have to work out where it was and go and collect it um, Emma asks, is gravity infinite on the singularity of a black hole? Uh, that's a, a very good question. The answer is uh, yes, as far as we can tell. If singularities do exist, uh, what that means is the, the tiny, infinitely small dot in the middle of a black hole that weighs as much as a star. And the closer to the singularity, the closer to that tiny dot you get, the stronger gravity gets. And uh, the... the uh, sorry, yeah, so the... Um, I'm mixing up my terms. I'm sorry. So yeah, so gra gravity is not in, in, in gravity is not infinite. The density is infinite. The gravity um, is actually the same as what kind of like the the pull of it. So uh, I, I always use the example, if you could turn the sun into a black hole, we wouldn't be sucked into the black hole because the black hole that the sun turned into would have the same gravitational pull as the sun. And so, you know, we would keep, it would go cold and dark, but we, we would keep on orbiting the black hole sun. So black holes don't have infinite gravity. What they have is infinite density because you take an entire star and you squish it into something infinitely small. Um, so black, black holes are very, very strange, but their gravitational pull isn't infinitely strong. It's the same as whatever made them. Um, Felix, age six. Um, I think I'm going to make this the last question because we're coming up to three quarters of an hour. Um, so um, really, really good question about that. I'm going to make this the last one, I think. Felix, age six, asks, if there was a hole all the way through our planet, what would happen if you jumped into it? That's an excellent question. Um, so first of all, the middle of our planet is very hot. And the deeper into our planet you get, the hotter it gets. So people that make really, really deep mines like dig really deep holes if you go down really really deep it's it's very very hot so the miners often have to wear like clothes that protect them from the really really hot temperatures when they go down to the middle so the first answer is you would get very 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 hot um but let's imagine that we give you like a special heat resistant spacesuit so you can jump all the way you can jump into the hole and you won't be affected by the temperature so what would happen is that you would fall down and down and down and down and down until the until you reach the middle of the Earth. But then because the hole is all the way through our planet, you would just carry on and then you would pass through the middle of the Earth. And then you would start going down the other side. But as you go down the other side, you'd actually be getting further and further and further away from the middle. And so as you as you you know fall down the hole, you'd almost you'd actually be falling 
up the hole away from the middle of the earth and you'd be slower and slower and slower and what would happen is that you would reach exactly the same height on the other side so if you drilled a hole starting in England and then coming out in Australia say for example you jumped in the hole you would fall all the way to the middle and you would carry on all the way to the other side and then you'd fall up the hole and you'd go slower and slower and then just as you reached Australia you would just poke your head out the hole and be able to say hello and then you would start falling down again and then you'd reach where you started and you would just kind of like boing 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 backwards and forwards through uh backwards and forwards through this hole forever and it would take about an hour and a half um to go to to start your journey then fall all the way through the earth and reach the other side would take you about an hour and a half which coincidentally is exactly the same amount of time as it takes to orbit the earth um, okay, well, thank you so much to everyone that's listening. I hope you've enjoyed this. I hope you find it. I hope you found it useful. I hope that you will remember that there is gravity everywhere in space, and astronauts don't float because there's no gravity. They float because they're in orbit. Um, uh, yes, yeah, so that is all. Uh, that is all from me. Like I said, um, if you've enjoyed this, please do consider uh, consider giving us a subscribe. We run all kinds of interesting events. Uh, we do astronomy talks for younger people. Starting in the winter, we're going to be doing some live stargazing. We have interesting stuff on here all the time. And if you want to follow me on Twitter, I am astronomy underscore Matt. Um, thank you so much, and enjoy the rest of your day.